Welcome once again to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast with the Legendino in Rio. Hello, Tim. Hello, and let's go to the Olympics in Paris in 24. Oh, 2024. Aha. Aha. No, 1924. The Olympic Games in Paris, 1924, uh, and uh, the Olympic football tournament. And what I think... Maybe this, I imagine this will go, uh, this has gone under lots of people's radar screens, but I think this is an absolutely huge moment in the development of our game. For me, this is the birth of modern football. 1924, Tim, TV wasn't even invented then. John um, Logie Baird hadn't done his thing. So we're not going to be able to watch it, are we? This match? There are some little clips of uh, of of this going on um this uh, olympic final which was uruguay and switzerland was the olympic final in 1924 uh and they're, they're fascinating clips i mean the ball doesn't look round to me i don't think it's round i don't think it's properly round it's you now haven't and, and obviously the pitch hasn't been watered the ball is just bouncing all over the place like some kind of some kind of uncontrolled rabbit you know um so uh it, it's hard to look at it from the eyes of who was there in the stadium 100 years ago. And there are a lot of people there in the stadium 100 years ago. And that's part of our story. Because what happens in the in the 24 Olympics is that, uh, first of all, it's the moment that football starts to outgrow the Olympics. Because football is the box office sensation. There's money in those there pitches, you know. Uh, Uruguay, their first game in the, in 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 the uh, in the tournament, there's three thousand in the ground. Come the final against Switzerland, there's tens of thousands locked outside the stadium can't get in. People want to see this. They really want to see this. So as a as a commercial entity, if you like, football is 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 outgrowing. But it's also the moment when football globalizes because right at the start of the Olympic football tournament, it was club sides taking part. And then it goes to national teams. And up until 1924, they'd all been from Europe, with the exception of Egypt, who played in 1920. We, we did one with an Egyptian a, 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 a few months ago. And it, it is striking how early Egypt was with football. In 24, you've got Egypt back. You've also got the States in. And you've got Uruguay. This is the first South American side coming in. And not a lot is known about them. You know, the world is a much, much smaller place, much bigger place, sorry, at this time. You know, not a lot is known about them. Uh, a lot of English sides went over to South America and played in Uruguay and Argentina at the start of the 20th century. But that kind of halted with the First World War. And it's then that the big changes come. Because at the very time that Europe is tearing itself apart on the Somme, South America is launching the Copper America, 1916. And in the first years, it's held annually, with the exception of other, that there's one that they couldn't hold because of the, the so-called Spanish flu. And so you're getting regular competition and a dramatic increase, uh, improvement in playing standards as a result of this, this competition every year. So when Uruguay come over, in 24, very, very little is known about. I mean, what is this little country, this tiny little country created almost artificially as a buffer state between Brazil and Argentina? No, what is it? What is this, this, this Uruguay? There is a story. I've never been able to firm this one up. But there's a story that FIFA, who organized the Olympic football tournament inside the, uh, the Olympics, that FIFA did a scarf with the flags of all of the competing countries and Uruguay, Uruguay's was missed out. I don't know if that's if if that's a kind of urban legend, but even if it's not true, it kind of is true, you know, because it, it tells you how little was known about this first South American side coming to Europe. Uh, not a lot is known about them. The powers of the game. Remember, the Olympics is amateur only. That's important as well. So that that rules England out out. Because England, you know, the game's been professional for, for decades. But uh, some of the powers of, of this new game are in Central Europe and they're, they're there. And it's kind of assumed that they're going to win. Assume away. Because Uruguay just cut a swathe through 
the entire tournament. I think their their their, their total record in the uh, in the competition, uh, and it's not groups group stage. It's just knockout all the way through, like a kind of FA Cup. Goals scored twenty, goals conceded two. There could not have been more convincing wingers uh, winners, and it it's not just about them winning. It's about how they're winning, what they do, how they're how they're playing. And it really sets off a fever for the game that you see with the crowd figures. You know, about ten thousand locked out of the stadium in Paris for 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 the final, uh, and and so it's the moment when people think, you know what, there's got to be a World Cup because this lot, Uruguay, they were man, they're good, and everyone was looking up to Eng- the English professionals as the, the ones who are setting the standards. We need a competition to see that's open to all. That's not just amateurs like the Olympics. We need a, need a competition that's open to amateurs and professionals and everyone. That's the World Cup. So, so much of this, it's the globalization of the game, the need for a World Cup and the possibility of the World Cup giving you a commercial return because there are people who are, uh, there are thousands who are prepared to pay money to go and watch this. It's the moment when football becomes the global game it's Uruguay winning the Olympic gold medal in 1924. Yeah, there are so many questions around this. I mean, my first thought was, what was different about football that it outgrew the Olympic Games, but not, let's say, athletics, for example, amongst other things. The other thoughts I was, I mean, a lot of people would have wondered, they would have seen that Uruguay is one of those enviable teams that has one of those or has four of those stars above its badge because the stars representing uh, world um, football success. And I always, because I always thought you know, Uruguay won two World Cups. They didn't win four, did they? No. But now I'm, now I'm beginning to understand. So we're, we're looking at this uh, match, the, um, the Olympic Games gold medal or final, anyway, for gold medal and silver positions. Um, it's 1924. I can hardly believe it. I mean, in, in some respects, you want to, you wish you had been there at the evolution of football, as it were. And in another respect, you thank goodness you weren't there. Otherwise, you'd be dead now. But <laughs> um, uh, th- so we're looking at the game, 9th of June, 1924, uh, Uruguay versus Switzerland. Do you know anything about the Swiss team at the time? Because I'm, I'm looking at some of the the results here, you know, they're winning, they're beating teams by nine goals, you know, nine goals and seven goals and five goals. It doesn't seem as if there's a huge amount of competition against them. They beat Lithuania 9-0 on the 25th of May, uh, 1924 in this competition, for example. Yeah, I don't know a great deal about them, but they were considered one of the, one of the, one of the early powers of, of, of the game. Um, and I think going into the tournament, people would have thought that, They've got more chance of winning than uh, than than Uruguay have. I mean, some people thought that Yugoslavia or the Kingdom of Serbia or whatever it was called were going to be tough, and Uruguay played them in the first game in front of no one and won seven nil. So straight away, there's there's a message out there. Wow, you know, look out for this, look out for this. And then as Uruguay go through the competition. The crowds keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, with the exception of the semi-final. Because in the quarter-final, they, they beat the hosts. They beat France. Mm-hmm. Big crowd there. I think that was a little, little bit of a downer. Um, and, and so, you know, the, that, that effect, you know, when you, the home side is eliminated from the tournament, oh, fuck mm. it, it doesn't, it's not really happening. So mm. not, not many people turned up for, the, for the, the semi against the Dutch. But come the final, they've all got over France being eliminated. They all mm. want to be in that stadium and, and, and see these sky blues. Who include now in mean, uruguay is at this time it's a country of immigration uh it's a country of especially italy and and spain um almost all of the team are sons of quite recent immigrants and one of them one of the one of the main players one of the inside forwards pedro sea was actually born in spain and went to uruguay as a as as, as a, a child and there's a black player in there as well. Yes, I know this because you told me about this before. Yeah, yeah. 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 Little, yeah they're Andrade. cheating. They're cheating, <laughs> aren't they? Those Uruguayans cheating. Well, they got a black player. It, it, it's uh, it's a pertinent point because the first Copa America, 1916. And how did Uruguay achieve such early prominence? 
It's really because of an Uruguay, as such a small country, they've sussed it. If we're so much smaller, we've got to be smarter. That's the only way we can do it. So there's massive investments in public education. It's a literate society. And one of the reasons that, that football spread so quickly, remember, this isn't only before TV, this is before radio as well. Mm. Um, it, it's, there's, a, there's a written press, you know, and people are reading. It's one of the things that spreads football so, so quickly. Um, it's the it's a kind of pioneer in welfare states with a kind of uh, eight hour working day and and people getting Saturday mornings off and so on uh, and th the more leisure time and you can see this all over with the growth of football the more leisure time people have the the better it is for for the growth of football because people tend to use or certainly the male population would use a lot of that that, that leisure time for for um, playing football and with this kind of application of of early social democracy. Football, which starts pretty much everywhere, and certainly in South America with the elites, it goes down the scale quicker. It goes down society quicker in Uruguay than it does elsewhere in South America. That's the reason that Uruguay was so prominent so early. And so, but the, the very first Copa America in 1916, there's a couple of black players in the team. Uh, the great Isabelino Gradin, who was, who, was, who was a winger, he was a top goal scorer in that competition. He was a sprinter as well. And uh, another midfielder, Juan Delgado, who was nothing like that at all. You know that stereotype that a lot of Afro-descendant players really hate when they get called uh, just pace and power. They really hate it, you know. Well, Delgado, you couldn't say that about him because he wasn't quick and he wasn't strong, but he was he was brainy. You know, he, he was the brains of the midfield. He would distribute game the games from the midfield. So the very first game that Uruguay play in, in the first Copa America 1916 is against Chile. And Chile consider launching an official protest because of these black players. They say Uruguay is selecting African professionals. Now, the, the, the massive, it, it, they get talked talk down out of it fairly quickly. But the, the massive irony here, it is only, it's, it's, an extra, it's an unbelievable irony, is that these black Uruguayans were seen by the opposition as illegitimate when they've been in Uruguay for a lot, lot longer than the white players who've only just turned up, you know. And you still get some of that, even in Brazil, you still get some of that, you know. You still get racist abuse towards towards prominent black Brazilians saying, uh, you, your place is Africa, you don't belong here, you know. Um, the, 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 the racial, as, as we're seeing with that, uh, that uh, very, very, yeah, that so that depressing Argentina song, the disgraceful song, the racial element is 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 there because really, the project in the South Cone of South America, in in, in Brazil, in Argentina, and Uruguay, the project was to whiten the country. To, and 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 back then, these were the dominant ideas of eugenics. You know that there are there is a kind of hierarchy of races, uh, and uh, um, you know, the and, and we're at the bottom. Yeah, we well, as in, are we, or is anybody below us in South America? The indigenous, uh, the indigenous probably because they were harder to enslave, and they they they, they weren't very effective as, as as enslaved people. The the, the indigenous. Uh, so th this is the South American elites thinking. Look at it. Look at this. You know, blacks and indigenous. We have to civilize our country. We have to improve our country. And the way to do this is to import a white labor force. So that there was an explicit hierarchy of racism in the fact that there were so many immigrants pouring in uh, from all over the place, mainly Italy, but Spain, Poland, the Middle East, all of these immigrants coming in, and that, that was, there was the idea of of, of forming this 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 civilizing white labor uh, labor force, and that meant, in the in the eyes of some, that these black Uruguayans were less legitimate Uruguayans than than uh, Uruguayans who who uh, hadn't been Uruguayans for very long. Little did they know, though, that Andrade was the prince, wasn't he? Yes, yeah, he was. He was also a circus performer and, oh, a, and a prince and a circus <laughs> performer yeah they've got to make uh, a movie and, about this guy <laughs> and, yeah well i think i, I think, so. I, I think this the, the uruguay team in 24 i think it, it, it deserves a film because 
there, there's there's wonderful backstories here. How are they going to pay for it? Are they going to pay to come over? Now, Uruguay is going through a boom time. And the key thing here is refrigeration. Because, uh, and I, I know you like your bully beef. You know, Frey yeah. Bentos is a, is a place in Uruguay. Yes, and with, <laughs> with refrigeration, you, you can keep yeah. that beef Mate. stored cold and you can ship it. And that, that's done wonders for, for the, the export market. So Uruguay is living a boom. But there's still this question of paying for the team to come over. Who's, who's going to do that? And that, that, was, that was a last minute affair. And, you know, that they go kind of steerage class on the ship. On, on, the, on the boat over and they, they, they're they going through Spain and that and fr- playing friendlies just to finance the, the whole thing. Um, so there's, there, there's, there's fantastic stories. It's also a really young team striking the, the ages of, of, of these players. There's one or two late twenties, but most of them are very, very early, early twenties. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to see a film about Ur- Uruguay 24. Now, if, if you can get Oscars out of the story of chariots of fire, I think there's, uh, there's there's more to come with uh, with something about Uruguay 24. And let's not forget Escape to Victory as well, not to be put in the same class as Chariots of Fire, obviously. Do you think, though, that, I mean, you, you mentioned, and by the way, I knew about this uh, refrigeration part, not specifically for Uruguay, but of course, you know as well as I do that <clears throat> nothing that uh, James Dean has ever been in escapes my notice. And <laughs> in East of Eden, it's this central theme of uh, East of Eden, at least the first part of it, the book by John Steinbeck, is refrigeration of uh, mm. vegetables during the First World War when it comes about. So I, I, I knew, that, you know, I understand the landscape of that, but mm-hmm. you've also told me, uh, and this part has fascinated me for years and years and years, that Uruguay was the first country in the world to institute a welfare state. Yeah. Now, I wonder what part that plays in the efficiency, the ability, I suppose, of uh, the team to go halfway across the world or th- thereabouts, across the Atlantic at least, and to win this international tournament. Well, it, it's just the fact that Uruguay, right from the start, are drawing on resources from all of their society. Mm-hmm. So if you've got mm-hmm. talent, you're in, you know. Uh, and Brazil are nowhere near this point, nowhere near. You know, Brazil's so much bigger. But Brazil is much, much more feudal. It's a few years later um, than and the, the Copper America starts in 16. Uh, uh, a couple of years before this 24 Olympics, there's a Copper America in, in Argentina. And Brazil's president intervenes to dissuade Brazil from selecting black players. Mm. It, it will be a disgrace to the nation. There's that idea of the, the again, it's, it's this eugenics thing. It's that idea that, the black presence is a is something to be ashamed of. You know, it, it's, it's a mongrelizes, um, and I use that word uh, guardedly. Mongrelizes, and that's how they saw themselves, wasn't it? Brazil saw themselves as a mongrel nation because they're a mix of uh, different races, if uh, you like. Bring in, bring in the European European labour force. You know, it's yeah. a, the time, the, the late nineteenth and early twentieth century. It's a time when these Europeans are are, are coming in. En masse, in order to replace the, the slave uh, enslavement is abolished in 1888, and the idea really is not to improve the lot of the enslaved. You know, it's just to kind of put them to one side, forget about them, forget about them, and and you replace them with a white labour force, and that's how you, in inverted commas, improve and civilise the country. Um, mm. These ideas, and it, it is really striking how widespread these these ideas of racial hierarchy were, and even some. Um, progressive people or people who would be seen as progressive shared some of this. When H.G. Wells did for a while, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. there's one there's one from, from boxing in um, in the States. You know, Jack London was, yeah. uh, you know, writing the man, you know, writer of the common man. Uh, and in one of the Jack Johnson fights, I can't remember who's it, who, who, who's it against, but he, he he writes a piece calling on for, for on, on the the other guy, the white guy, you know, to beat Jack Johnson, and reclaim the title for the white man, you know, <laughs> the, 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 these That's racial ideas. Pr- are probably, so where the, probably where the great white hope idea comes from as well. Exactly. And um, you see, when you say it like that, I look at sort of immigration policies today, and 
I know they wouldn't use the same reasons, the sort of Europeanizations of uh, different countries, but it's a lot, lot harder now, as you know, and as everybody listening will know, it's a lot, lot harder to get um, a visa, let's say, to anywhere in Europe. But, you know, Britain that we're familiar with, it's a lot harder if you come from Africa than if you come from Australia, let's say, for example. Well, tell me about it. My, my, my brother's just had an almighty battle bringing his wife into England. and She's from mm-hmm. Cambodia. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Almighty battle and a lot yeah. of money, you know. Mm. Yeah. Did he succeed in the end? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it, was a, it, 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 it took a lot of time and a lot of effort. And it, it's his wife. And it's the mother of his kids. I think describe. it's fed. I think it's fair to ask where where does all the money go because you're right it's a huge yeah, amount of money and yeah, it's thousands. money yeah exactly and just to get a visa and in in Nigeria the way it works is you go and stand outside uh, the British embassy in the blazing heat for certainly a day um, to be seen if not days because it happened to my uh, my stepmother's sister, and she was like by then in her 80s. My brother was doing everything. My brother, who's a lawyer from over this side, was doing everything to try and, um, you know, enable her to come in, sending money and so on. If you get turned down for whatever discrepancy, you know, you might have forgotten to bring something along or whatever, yeah. that's it. Your thousands of pounds is done. You've got to yeah. start again from the start beginning, etc. Yeah. So they make it very hard. Having said that, Uruguay, though, why why were they, and it's a small country, did they not have, did they have enslaved people at the time? Did they enslave people? No, or no, they didn't? no. It, okay. it, 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 had been, it had been part of Brazil. Yeah. So that, hence the, the, the Afro-descendant um, uh, presence. But no, uh, enslavement in, in Uruguay and in Argentina as well, it ended long, long decades and decades and decades before um, before it, it, it ended in, in Brazil. So they, they were the, the black, the Afro-descendant um, populace of, of Uruguay, which is relative, relatively small, um, they, they hadn't been enslaved for, for some time. Okay, so now you've got a full squad going over to Paris. Um, they're the only ones of the South Americans represented. I know the Olympic yeah. Games wanted to have a representation from all the continents. We've already said Australia wasn't in it. Egypt, yeah, Africa and Turkey uh, was <laughs> representing Asia when half of Turkey, you could argue, is in Asia, but yeah. the other half is in Europe. So they stretched the sense of representatives from every other continent. And they had North America as well as South America. Why was there no other representation from South America? Do you know? Well, it costs money to go, you know. Yeah, so uh, they declined. Yeah, I mean, um, on the basis of Uruguay winning in 24, Mm. Argentina thought, well, (laughs) we're going next time, you know. So next time Argentina go as well. Next time is is in Amsterdam, it's in Holland. Uh, and the final four years later is Uruguay against Argentina and Uruguay win again. So the, the, the two Olympic gold medals, it's the only gold medals Uruguay have ever won, ever in the history of the Olympics. Uh, and that's why there's the four stars, because they got the World Cup wins of 30 and 50 and the Olympic gold medals of 20, 24 and 28. And those Olympic tournaments were organised by FIFA, hence the fact that Uruguay think they're, they're justified in, in, in including them as, as, as four stars. It's basically the same team or very, very similar, the team that wins as a very young side that wins the Olympic gold in, in 24, defends the title successfully in 28, and wins the first World Cup in, in 30. It's the same group of players, um, the same very, very famous names in Nasazi, the defender, the great captain, uh, Andrade, the Black Pearl, um, the two inside forwards, Scaroni and Seya, Petroni, the the centre forward. This is the this is the group that achieves all of these things together, and you see this at uh, at the end of the 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 final there in Switzerland when the final whistle whistle blows and it's three 0 The crowd are so happy that they call on the teams to walk round the pitch. So you, ah. you get this, this this walk round the pitch. This is the birth. Of oh the lack of honour. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and the, 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 the lack of honour, even today in South America, it's known as the Olympic lap mm. because this, this habit starts with Paris in 1924. Do you know who else was there um, in the crowd, probably celebrating the Uruguay 
victory. Uh, Hemingway? The, well, it could have been Hemingway. That's not a bad shout. No, Deng Xiaoping, who, of course, no. became... Yeah, What's Deng the... Xiaoping was there. He was working in France at the time. He had to pour... As a waitress his, in a cocktail bar? Uh, he pro- possibly, very possibly. <laughs> um, the stereotype is usually, you know, Chinese got to be a laundrette in the Hollywood movies, doesn't yeah. it? Um, and um, Or a laundry company, whatever. But he had to pawn his overcoat uh, to be able to get a ticket for the final. Wow. And he's talked about it. He has been interviewed about it. So I'm, I'm giving you the sense of what football, how widespread football was around the world at the time. Yeah, it's the, bloke, the phenomenon of those games. The oh. bloke that was to become the leader of China after Mao Zedong, um, fell out with Mao Zedong, by the way. But anyway, uh, the bloke that was going to be the leader of China subsequently. Fell out with a the great Chinese, helmsman. Yes, exactly. the great helmsman. Yeah, well, his um, his uh, record has been reassessed <laughs> over time, as you know, yeah. with many of these people. Yeah, they they can't avoid it. Eventually, if they don't live longer than their critics, uh, they're going to get it in the neck, aren't they? Uh, yeah. Uruguay's Pedro Petroni, eighteen years old, still the youngest uh, Olympic gold medalist in a football tournament. Do you know anything about him, Pedro? Petroni? Yeah, he, he was. Uh, um, we did one a while back about Dixie Dean. Yes, yes. And and Petroni was was a was a was a kind of Dixie Dean figure. He, he um, had the same middle party, didn't he? Uh, yes, Dixie yes, Dean. Yeah, 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 well, did, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, kind of sturdy, direct, uncomplicated. Mm. So he's the centre forward, and he really benefits that the following year that you've got that change in the offside rule where instead of two players, two defenders and a goalkeeper, it's only one defender and a goalkeeper, which benefits the centre forward. So just as Dixie Dean really benefited from that change in the, in the offside law, so did uh, Petroni. So Petroni is 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 he's, he's not that involved in the build-up. He's the finisher. Uh, and it, it's the wingers and the two inside forwards there who are Scaroni and, 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 and Seya, who who are, are, are the artists of the thing, although they're all they're all banging goals in. Um, another one who was there is uh, it's it's a, it's a very very important name in, in development of football, a French writer called Gabriel Hano, uh, and that the French are such great organisers. And Hano, soon afterwards, he becomes the brains behind the launch of France, the French professional league, and then thirty years after this, he's the brains behind the launch of the European Cup. Well, there you so go. Th- 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 he's a he's a big figure, Gabriel Hano, and, and he was he he just couldn't get over what he'd seen. I got some of the quotes from from his article here, um, but about the Uruguayans that he wrote at the time, um, marvelous virtue vir- virtuosity in receiving the ball, controlling it and using it, impeccable technique, pushed towards perfection, the art of the feint and the dodge and the swerve. But they also ah. know how to play quickly. Yes, but they also know how to play quickly and directly. So they ain't just a circus attraction, you know. That that um. They created a beautiful football, elegant, but at the same time, varied, rapid, powerful and effective. And, and this is key, these fine athletes are to the English professionals like Arab thoroughbreds next to farm horses. (laughs) Now, what Hano is saying there is, come on, let's have a World Cup. Uh, And it's 30 years later that when he launches the European Cup, he's enraged by wolves. Because no European Cup, Wolves are playing Honved of Hungary now with all French pushkas. It's basically the Hungarian national side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's a real high prestige friendly. And Wolves just water the pitch and make it, make it a mud bath and then beat Honved and then proclaim themselves champions. And Hanno is saying, you can't, you can't have that. You okay. can't have that. We're going to have a proper competition, you know, home and away. Equal, you know, level playing field to find out who's who's really the best. So uh, what he did in the, in the fifties to launch the European Cup, he was doing in the twenties to try and get the World Cup up and running. I was just seeing that Petroni had a nickname. What was Do you that? know what that was? No, you you will not like it, Tim. Go on. You will not like it. You coming from one side of North London won't like it. <laughs> well, he, oh, it's the Archilero. The Archilero, yeah, the gunner. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Just thought yeah. I'd tell you that. Yeah. I couldn't resist yeah. it. But yeah, he's a gunner. He's never, a gunner. Never, never went anywhere near Woolwich. <laughs> Paris is the closest he ever got to Woolwich. 
<laughs> yeah, um, they were a fit team, though. They were a fit team, weren't they? Yeah. Is that partly why they were able to... I mean, first goal went in first half, fair enough, but the, yeah. the, the main thrust of the uh, match was in the second half where Uruguay scored two goals to no reply um, from Switzerland. I wonder if fitness has anything to do with it yeah, as well. Perhaps. Perhaps Although better prepared. It's, it's much easier running with the ball and running after the ball. And they've got yeah, the ball, yeah. and, and and they make you dance dance to their tune. So yeah. they're, they're they're imposing the game on you, and it's 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 all it's always more tiring and more demoralising to to run following running after them than it is to uh, to run with a ball. But yeah, they, they, well, they were a, they were a young side with plenty of gas in the tank. Uh, they'd shaken off the effects of that that long Atlantic crossing, you know, by boat. With these friendlies that they played in 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 Spain and in France, as as preparation, uh, well, I think more than fitter, they're just better, and that yeah. that that exposure to regular competition every year in the Copa America, uh, that that's got them to a to a level, you know, at, at a time when Europe is tearing itself apart on the on the, on, on the battlefield, mm. and twenty four is still it's only six years after the First World War, you know, the First World War is such a traumatic event. Um, it's where you know the first world war is where and possibly that that's why it's switzerland in the final you know that because switzerland have have suffered less less than 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 some of the other countries but you know the first world war is where old fashioned deference meets the machine gun yeah, uh, and yeah. there's only one winner in that fight isn't there of course um it does seem as if from what i've read in any case that the uruguayans were better prepared as well that they were one of the early teams to have realised the importance of having not only sort of a team doctor with you, but also uh, physios with you. Um, and it seems like they were, um, you, you know, like a team today, it's oftentimes in the sort of top flights, the difference between one team or another is the, the way that they're able to um, develop what they need um going forward you know bringing innovation is what i was thinking um yeah. you know whether it be in fitness people talked a lot about that with regards to arsene wenger for example changed the um english game because of his attitudes to fitness and diet and all that sort of stuff and sometimes that makes a difference it seems that uruguay was one of the first teams uh to take a, a football match seriously to that respect. Yeah, perhaps and, because it is like fighting a war for them in a way you know yeah. it's there's a famous quote from the fellow who coached them coached in 66. Other countries have their history. Uruguay has its football. Mm, yeah. You know, yeah. winning at football and seeing your flag up there, it's like the proof that your little nation exists. And what else do people think about when they think about Uruguay? If they think about it at all, you know. Free Bentos. Yeah, Free that's Bentos. the only thing. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm looking at a picture of the Uruguay team at this 1924 uh, Olympics in France, you know, and it, it is striking that Andrade is there. It is very striking in what must have been an all-white tournament, with maybe the exception of Egypt. And even there, I wonder if they had actually any no. black players there, to be honest. But Andrade sticking out here, it's historic. 1924, mm -hmm. I mean, it would be it would be at least 40 or 50, 50 years at least, I would have thought, before England had the equivalent, even though we had uh, sizable... Um, African Caribbean population over this side. I mean, it's nearly fifty years before you start, maybe forty years or so before you really start seeing black players coming into the English leagues. Well, actually, fifty years and maybe even more because yeah. the one or two were there before were idiosyncrasies, weren't there? Mm -hmm. do, do you know if? I mean, first of all, I'd like to know how Andrade is regarded today in Uruguay as a hero or otherwise. Do other footballers look up to him? In the oh, all, all, all this team, all this team are. are, are Heroes. Yeah, they're all heroes. I think maybe in the Uruguayan psyche, some of this. I remember being in the football museum at the stadium in Uruguay, the Centenario Stadium that they built for the 1930 World Cup. There's a little museum in there and they were showing films of this time, of the Olympics. And there was there was a, a visiting group of school kids and they were like special needs kids. And I just remember how fascinated they were by these images, being able to see their city and their stadium when it was clips from the 1930 World Cup and to see 
their country and all the ticker tape parades and so on afterwards. And they were, they were transfixed. It, it, it re- there, it, there really was a strong relation between these kids and these images that they were seeing. It's very, very touching. I loved it. In, so th- these are important conquests. I think perhaps in the popular psyche in Uruguay, it's been obfuscated. Can you say that in English? Does that make sense? It's yeah, been yeah, eclipsed it a, a little bit by 1950. Because mm-hmm. 1950, when they won here in Rio in the Maracanã Stadium, it, it, it's it's such a perfect Uruguayan triumph. And this is in nation. the World Cup as opposed to the Olympic yeah, yes. gold. Yeah, yeah. And so th- that's so often the reference. I remember when I started going to Uruguay um, uh, the early years of the century, you would see a group of young supporters did it. They made this big banner with Uruguay 1950 written on it, just 1950. So I, th- I think uh, all of, all of the, this generation, they're massive heroes but the ones that are held up highest in the in the, the kind of pantheon would be the ones from 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 1950 it must have affected uh, social relations in uruguay that one of these original heroes was a black guy you know it, it must have affected yeah but you know but, but the, the two from 1916 you know and gradin is the hero he's a top yeah, scorer yeah. Gra- gradin uh, isabelino gradin is without ever ever playing for a Brazilian team is one of the most important figures in Brazilian football as well, because he's the top scorer of the, of the Copa America in 16. And then in 19, there's a Copa America in Brazil and Gradin comes and plays. And the local black population are just transfixed by it because football at this time in, in, in Brazil is very, very much an elite thing. There's a, one of the, the best players in the Brazil side is black. But he's black mother and wealthy German father, Friedenreich, after Friedenreich. So he, he's not really one of us, you know what I mean? He's, he's, he's like born in a tuxedo. He's, he's not one of us dock workers or something. Gradin, on the other hand, he's us. That's us. Look, we can do this too. If Gradin from Uruguay can do this thing, we can do it. And that had a huge effect on the development of football. In fact, lots of things that happen in Brazilian football are a consequence of, of developments in Uruguay. And professionalism is a, is, a, is, a deve- is, is a reaction to professionalism in Uruguay. And then Uruguay nicking Brazil's best players who happen to be black, you know. I mean, but it, it wouldn't have happened in Brazil as quickly were it not been for Uruguay. So Uru- the, the, the story of Uruguayan football is not only fantastic in, it, in its, its effects on Uruguay, it's also in its effect on Brazil. And in this particular tournament, this 24 Olympics, its effect on the global game in showing the commercial possibilities of football and showing the need for a World Cup. Yeah, and, and 60,000 people, as you've said already, 60,000 people watching this, another 10,000 outside. That was the best attended uh, Olympic football match for the next 28 years, you know, until 1952. Uh, nobody else came anywhere near it. And this is without some of the big names uh, omitted from this. It, it was, it's not just England that didn't take part, uh, or Great Britain, as it would have been, that didn't take part in these Olympics. It was Denmark as well. And when you look at some of the Swedish scores, Sweden, if you'd followed this tournament, you would have thought, oh, looks like Sweden are going to win it, because they are there beating everybody, aren't they, by uh, five goals or seven goals or otherwise. Are they going to take uh, that gold medal back to Judeberg? <laughs> Not to you, to Bori, no. And they no. probably never, Bori. ever will. And Bori now, means but... castle. Yes, it does. It does. You're absolutely yeah. right. Bori, you're Bori. It's like a, a what? Bori, it's like a Y at the end of it instead of a G. So moving forward 100 years, because we're about to see a repeat of a, um, an Olympic uh, what, what a shame that Uruguay ain't there. They didn't qualify. There's only two places available for South America. It would have been and brilliant. It, it would have been great. It would have been great. Yeah. And Uruguay really wanted to, really wanted to be sure, there. Sure, sure. Very, very disappointed not not to qualify. Uh, but I hope that it gets honoured anyway, you know, you, because it's such a significant moment. I totally agree with you. Yeah, but I doubt if it will. You know, I doubt if it will. Yeah. But um, yeah. do you think though? And we started the conversation like this that you know football outgrew or this was a moment that it outgrew the olympics became more important if you like than the olympics or this part of the olympics became yeah. the most successful part of it did you do you not think 
that is the case today. Why, why, why does the Olympics um, insist on, persist, if you like, on uh, having a football tournament? We've just come off the back of a Euros. You know, yeah. you know, I, I know that there are different rules for the Olympics. Uh, you know, well, for the men's tournament, age. yeah. The men's tournament, yeah. you've got to be a certain age and so on. Not for the women's. Um, but is it is it necessary? Is it really necessary? Well, the, the Olympics does does the football tournament. In the Olympics does two things. It nationalises the events because it takes games. It takes the games all around the country. You know, um, so it's not just restricted to the capital city. Sure, sure. It also, it also sells tickets. It yeah, makes, it money. makes money. Yeah, it makes yeah. money. Uh, nice unlike there. some, unlike some of the other um, disciplines that, again, they can take around the country. You know, you take the cycling event, you take it around the country. You take the rowing events, take it around the country. Uh, much of the Olympics can be outside, you know, the host city, as it were. But I suppose the revenue has to, you know, you have to follow the revenue wherever it does. Okay, it makes a lot of money. But does anybody in the football firmament take it? seriously nigeria yeah, does do. because we've won yeah, it you know yeah, yeah we do but <laughs> surprisingly so perhaps so yeah. maybe maybe more than if you've maybe won more it. Than it should. If but you've i, won I think it. any time there's a tournament yeah it, it's the tournament it's a little bit like when you're inside a tournament it's a little bit like huckleberry finn being yeah, on his raft yeah. you know okay. just everything <laughs> everything is there on your raft yeah. and that's it that's your that's your little world that's your world yeah tournament, yeah, and tournaments do this to you, you know. So even if it's the Mickey Mouse Challenge Cup and you get a tournament, you know, while you're there, that's your little Huckle Huckleberry Friend raft. That's your yeah. world. Huckleberry. Just checking that you got the right pronunciation. <laughs> How do they say Huckleberry Finn in, in Brazil? I've yeah. never heard it said. <laughs> <laughs> I might try, I I might try family on that one. Yeah, I would love, I would love to hear how they say Huck that. I'm laughing already. Huckley Bay. Huckley Bay. <laughs> Tim, don't kill me, man. Don't kill me. What about, hey, what about you... uh, Donkey Shy? I quite yeah. like Donkey Shy. I don't, I don't mind that because we get it wrong because we, we've only just recently learned to say Don Quixote rather than Don Quickso or Quixote <laughs> or whatever we used to call it when we were kids. Um, yeah. We've got time, though, to have a brief look at the uh, musical landscape, as we always Why do not? on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. So we always identify an iconic game, and this is as iconic as any. Uh, Uruguay winning uh, the 1924 Olympic gold in football against Switzerland, 3-0. Uh, so what kind of music was going on at the time? I think it's one word and it rhymes with ass. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're in the yeah. jazz age, aren't we? I, the, yeah, the, the 20s, yeah. increasingly, the 20s fascinate me um, because... I've, I've been thinking more and more about this recently, just the extent to which, in a way, that the 20s is a kind of dress rehearsal for the 60s. You reckon? Yeah, I do, yeah. Um, more, obviously, in the 60s, more people can get involved. So there's, you know, it, the, the changes in society go wider. Yeah. But a lot of this is happening, coming out, because you're coming out of the First World War, and that gives people an absolute hunger for new ways of living, new ways. Let's, you know, let's bury the old world and let, let's... So in the flappers, for example, the flapper women, the Louis, the Louis Brooks hairstyle, there's a bit of Mary Quant and the, you know, the, 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 uh, and the Vidal Sassoon Bob in all of that, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's, in, in this game, I don't know if you saw the, the, the footage, if you saw them, behind the goals, there's two photographers one of them's got a boat on, but one of them's got a light suit on and one's got a dark suit. And the suits, they're absolutely brilliant. And they're quite slim fitting. They're not those massive suits that became popular in, 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 in the, the 30s and 40s, you know, the big zoot suits. You look at those suits and you, you, that's the model for the suits in the 60s. Um, I, I bought a, an expensive suit from, from Italy last, uh, last year and that was modelled on a cut from 1919, immediately after the First World War. But it's kind of 60s style, because some of the things that were happening in the 60s were retreads of stuff that was going on going on in the 20s. That's not, not only sartorially, but also in terms of new ways of doing things. And and in, 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 the, in the way that the 60s, certainly for a British audience, was wake up. 
to black American music. The twenties is a similar thing with jazz. I think you know j- jazz. It, the twenties is the decade when jazz consolidates itself as the American art form. Um, Irving Berlin wrote. He said in 1924, in our year, he said that jazz is the rhythmic beat of our everyday lives. Uh, It's the year that Gershwin writes um, Rhapsody in Blue. And it's also the main man of the whole thing for me is Louis Armstrong. Of course. 24, he's he's gone from New Orleans to Chicago in, I think it's 22. Yeah. And he's really set things off there with the King Oliver band in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 24 is when he falls out with that and he, go, he goes to New York. Mm-hmm. And stuff now, when he goes to New York, stuff is really, really going to happen. Because what he's, he's doing now, he's, 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 he's mastering his craft. And from 25, he's going to make recordings that are the first time that improvisation has ever been recorded. It's never happened. People have never caught improvisation recorded before. You know, some of the, the, the great classical composers, they may well have been into improvisation. We don't know because all we got is the, is, is, is the music that was written down. But with jazz, with an advancement in recording techniques, you can get this stuff recorded. And that, that's a huge... So the idea of recorded improvisation, I think, is really, really important. And with Armstrong, the way that he plays his instrument is different. But also, he starts singing as well, and no yes, one has ever yes. no one's ever sung like Armstrong yes. sang before. Yeah, well, no, you know, the, the scat thing and around and, the line and around the yeah. beats. You know, it, 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 it is a revolution in in the whole concept of of popular music and the freedom with which with, with, with which you can approach it. Yeah, although I would say, and this is looking at the big sellers of 1924, and by sellers they meant the song sheet selling. In those days, it was the publishers. Yeah, the publishers made the money. And, um, you know, when you said it in the 60s, it was time to wake up to black music. Arguably here, it's time to wake up to black face music uh, with come on in here, come on in there. Yeah, Alexander's Ragtime Band, in the mm-hmm. guise of one Asa Yolson, as his mm-hmm. original name from uh, the immigrants, child of uh, Russian Jewish emigres to the United States, who was once upon a time called. He, he then anglicized his name to Al Jolson. A- and he was a decent singer, mate. He was a decent singer and a performer, but he. Um, couldn't see the future that at some point in the future it might be a bit embarrassing to show that he used to blackface at the time and um well just took the mickey out of black people's uh the 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 color of their skins and the ways that they express themselves and so on climb up on my knees sonny boy you are only three sonny boy and, you know, you had to give it the old wide eyes and big white teeth mm-hmm. and all on top of that, which makes us laugh today. It seems almost improbable, but at the time, that was one of the styles. That it, and it, his biggest selling hit of 24 was California, Here I Come, you know, which was nothing to do with black at all. It's about the uh, wintry winds still blowing and the snow is starting mm-hmm. to fall. California have been blue. You know, not I've been black. California, I've been blue. So why the blackface? How do you feel on this issue about Armstrong? Because when Armstrong, at this point, 24, he is an absolute revolutionary. He's so mm-hmm. far ahead of the curve, it's untrue. But you fast forward 25 years or so, and then Armstrong this uh, hates bebop. He has a kind of war against against bebop. He has a, wow. he has a, he has a slanging match with, with, with Dizzy Gillespie. And mm. also that famous scene there in the New Orleans Carnival, Armstrong Black Faces. So the, the one, and you see this so often, the one who led one revolution is, is behind is, is behind the curve on, on the next. How oh, yeah. do you see Armstrong from that, that perspective? We all grow older, Tim. We know what you think of a lot of the modern music, you know, as yeah. much as you know you never think it's going to happen to you. Yeah, I know, you? but it, it happens to you. And yeah. also, remember, um, blackface aside, Armstrong could do anything he wants to do. He's, he is 
as recognised as the creator as anybody else. Jelly Roll Morton may beg to differ, but it's certainly Armstrong that took jazz music out of the brothels of New Orleans and put it on the landscape of American music. I mean, if if you look from 1924, uh, the biggest success goes to white jazz artists. It's not yeah, black or white jazz artists. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. It's not black jazz artists that are making the most of the money by now. Remember, if it was still if it wasn't for Armstrong, this would still be considered to be race music, as they would have called it in those yeah. days, and not to be seen on the mainstream um whether live music landscape or recorded music landscape. So it, it, he's the guy that has broken it through. And yeah, he might regret some of that in reflection. But I think he's got... If Al Jolson had invented jazz music rather than appropriated it and then kind of took the mickey out of those from whence it developed, I don't think I'd be sitting here saying, yeah, but he blackfaced it. I'd say, well, apart from that, the main thing is that he invented jazz music. Um, I said to you, he's a good singer. You know, I'm not, I'm not knocking somebody mm-hmm. who's got a talent, but you don't always see the future. I'm sure Armstrong understood where bebop was coming from, but he had turned a curve where it wasn't, it wasn't really happening right. for him. And it's also, you know, I tell you my experience of growing older, um, gracefully or otherwise, is that you hold a grudge when the new lot come along without giving you your proper props, mate, you know? And there's something going on in black literature at the moment, which is fine. You know, I love it, black British literature. But, mate, it was me. It was me. (laughs) It was me, yeah, me that broke it through (laughs) in 1992 with The Express and everything that was uh, black. We were the biggest uh, uh, publishers of black interest uh, literature uh, throughout the 90s in this country but now there's another generation they've taken it somewhere else they're doing much better than we've mm-hmm. done but hey where are my props where are my props it's like uh in the words of the jungle brothers tribes like us all, always open doors but what for so you can get yours in the end you just have to be happy that you have opened those doors and made it possible for other people to go through Talking of jungle, it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes you wonder how, how I keep from going under. That's life. That's the music industry. It moves very fast and it caught up with uh, Louis Armstrong. Having said that, I think he had moved into another sphere in any case, just like Frank Sinatra and the mm-hmm. jazz greats of their generation became mainstream and uh, cabaret to a certain extent but certainly uh, popular, more popular than they'd ever been in their lives by the 1960s and 1970s, in any case. Mate, it was uh, the beginning of a lot of music, 1924. I find find this era increasingly fascinating because you're you're in a ground level with football as a global phenomenon. You're in a ground level with, 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 with jazz breaking through as the American art form. There's a phrase I love. That French critic used a few years later about Ellington. Mm. He hasn't just invented a new art form; he's invented a new reason to live. Uh, and you know, to to be in at that where these new reasons to live are appearing, uh, it, it makes you want to have a have a time machine and go back and spend some time in the Roaring Twenties. <laughs> 